begin our time by saying something to you that you may or may not realize. And that is that the best way to get somebody to retain something that you might be saying to them is through a story. Story that has a way of, you know, entering in. Stories have a way of capturing a person's heart and their imagination. And when you go through the scriptures and you go through history, you find that there was nobody better at telling a story than Jesus. Jesus could take something that was very, very difficult. He could take something that was very, very complex and through a story, make it plain and make it simple for everybody to see and to hear and understand. In today's study, we're going to see Jesus tell a story that's very, very profound. And so with these things in mind, let's go ahead and begin reading together. We pick up our study here in the book of Luke. In Luke chapter 8, and we start right there in verse 1. And it reads, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had also, who had been cured, rather, of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had Come out, Joanna, the wife of Chris, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna, and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathered, and the people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. He told this story. A farmer went out. To sow his seed. As he was gathering the seed, some fell along the path, and it was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered. When it, when it came up, brother, the plants were with it withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell along thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that those seen, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not understand. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. But they have no root. They believe for a while, but in time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked up by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. Stop right here if you will. Let me have your attention. There are three things that are going on here. Three very important things. And they are, and please write these down. Number one, the women who at their own expense supported the ministry of Jesus. Number two, seeds and soil. Number three, kingdom Secrets. Three very important things. And again, I want you to write these things down because, again, these things are going to help you. They're going to bless you. Okay, let's go ahead and deal with number one. The women who at their own expense were supporting the ministry of Jesus. Looking in, if you will, at verse one there. It says, after this, 
after what? Now, if you were here in our last study, you would recall how that there was this woman, this loose woman, maybe even a prostitute who came to Jesus. And she just stood behind Jesus. And she just wept. And she wept and she wept. So she had heard Jesus say, come unto me, all of you who are heavy laden and burdened out and who need rest. And this woman said, that's me. My lifestyle, my life is heavy laden. I'm burdened down. And Jesus, I need rest. So she came to where Jesus was. And she didn't say a word. She stood behind Jesus and she just wept. She wept. She wept so much that her tears fell on Jesus' feet and began to wipe. And then she got down on her uh, hands and knees, rather, and wiped his feet with her hair. And then she took this very expensive jar of perfume. She poured it out on Jesus. And so, as it says there again in verse 1, after this, after all of that, then Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chris, the manager of Herod's household. Suzanne and others, these women were helping to support them out of their own means. Stop right there. Let me have your attention. Women supporting and helping in the ministry of Jesus. Women, and that's so important. What I want you to see, what I want you to hear, what I want you to know is this, that these women were disciples of Jesus. They were just as much disciples of Jesus as Peter, James, and John. They were just as much disciples of Jesus than all of the others. These women, these women, check this out. These women believed in Jesus. They followed Jesus, and therefore, they supported the work of Jesus. Let me say that again. They believed in Jesus, and therefore, they followed Jesus. And because they believed in him and they followed him, they also supported the ministry of Jesus. To understand something, just because you believe in Jesus does not make you a disciple of Jesus. Just because you believe in Jesus, that does not make you a disciple of Jesus. What makes a person a disciple of Jesus is when they believe in Jesus and they follow Jesus and they support the work of Jesus. Write this scripture down. This comes from the book of James. In James chapter 2, in verse 19, it says, You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So you can have an intellectual faith. You can have an emotional faith and not be a soul-saving faith. So again, to be a, a follower of Jesus, to be a disciple of Jesus, again, means to believe in Jesus. It also means that you follow Jesus, but it also means that you support the work of Jesus. Understand something. God does not need us to do anything. He doesn't need anything from us. He's the all-sufficient God. He's all-sufficient. One of my uh, passage scriptures I like in the Bible, is we had King David. King David, you know, was in his palace and you know, he's living large and he's in his palace and he looks out the window and he sees the, the, uh, the ark of God in a tent. And so David in his heart says, man, this is not right. This is not right for me to be living in luxury while the ark of the Lord is in a tent. I will build the Lord a house. To which the Lord says, David. And in the words of my wife, David, that's cute. That's cute, David. See you rubbing off on me, girl. 
That's cute. David, you're going you gonna to build me a house? And the Lord says to David, David, check this out. Heaven is my throne. And the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you're going to build for me? So the Lord doesn't need us. But the Lord does want us to engage in what it is that he's doing because he knows that when we do so, we find joy. The Lord doesn't need us, but again, he wants us and he allows us to partner with him because when we do so, we find great joy. Listen to the scripture. This comes from the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 16. Psalms chapter 16, verse 11, it says this, and it's kind of paraphrased. It says, in him, talking about in God, is the fullness of joy and at his right hand, eternal pleasures. In the book of Acts, it's talking about for us as believers, in him do we move and breathe and have our very being. And so God doesn't need us, but he wants us to engage with him, to be involved in what it is that he's doing, because when we do so, we find great joy. We all, as human beings, we say, man, I want to find joy. I want to be happy. I want to be uh, peaceful. How do we do that? Again, we know that when we go do our own thing, chasing our own ways, we don't find it there. Amen. Many times when we do all of that, what do we find? We find misery. We find pain. We talked about this last week, how that sometimes the very things or the very people that we run after and we chase after and we get these things. Many times we get in there and we go, oh my God, how did I get in this mess? Lord, please get me out of this relationship. But God says, but I, I tried to tell you that going in. I told you he wasn't any good. I told you she wasn't any good. But no, you just had to do it. But now you're going, God, please get me out of here. So there's many times again that we chase after things and get those things or get those people, get those relationships and find ourselves misery, miserable. So if we really want to be happy, again, we engage with God and in the things of God, and he makes sure again that we find the joy that we're looking for. So here's the thing. Again, God doesn't need us, but he desires us to partnership with him. And when we partnership with him, we find joy. When we give to the work of the Lord, we are not only blessed, but others are blessed as well. Listen to this. Write the scripture now. This comes from the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 15, in the latter part of verse 27, it says this. It says, if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. Let me say that again. Romans chapter 15, latter part of verse 27. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. And so these women, because they were blessed by Jesus, they wanted to bless Jesus. They supported the ministry out of their own means. And man, I'm so glad that they did. I'm so glad the women were a part of the ministry. Can you imagine what ministry would be like without women? Can you imagine that? That's not a pretty picture. Imagine this. I can clearly see this happening. You got Jesus and you have the disciples. As it says here, they went from place to place spreading the good news. Not the bad news, but the good news about the kingdom. So they're going from place to place to place. And I can see them getting ready to go into this town, getting ready to go on this crusade. And I can see one of the women going, you guys getting ready to go? Yeah. And looking at Jesus, say, Jesus, you're not going to wear that, are you? 
See, y'all women laugh because y'all know y'all always trying to dress us. We walking out the house, you're, you're not wearing that, are you? So as it was now, so it was then. I can see Jesus getting ready to go. He, he all prepared in his head and he getting ready to go and they're going, Jesus, uh, you ain't wearing that, are you? Yeah, what's wrong with this? Typical man, what's wrong with this? Hold up, Jesus. Put this on. Right? I can also see them getting ready to go out and, you know, one of the women walking up to Peter, you know, said, Peter, if Jesus feeds the people today for the love of God, Peter, use a napkin. Last time Jesus did the bread and the fish thing, man, you had food all up in your beard and stuff like that. Peter, for the love of God, use a napkin. I can see them going to James and John. Guys, guys, please. It's because somebody says no to you. Doesn't mean you have to call down fire from heaven and burn them up. Come on, guys. You guys maybe need to go to anger management classes or something. But the women just bought a special blessing to the ministry then, just like they do now. See, guys, again, we build houses, but women make homes. Amen? To show you how much we need the women, we had a men's uh, breakfast a while back. And typical guys, we like, all right, get everything. Yes, you know, so and so are bringing this meat, and this other guy's bringing this meat, and this other guy's bringing this meat. Okay, so we got some some meat and some meat and some more meat. Okay, we got some we got some beans. We need a salad. Okay, potato salad. No, better than that. Okay, coleslaw. So we got meat and meat and meat more meat and we got some potato salad and we got some coleslaw and we got some baked beans guys you ready to eat yes let's pray we pray over the food we go to get it ain't no plates ain't no cups there's no napkins there's no silverware but we ready though. We ready. The stuff that's important to the fellas, we got it. But now we're scrambling around. And so it again, so it is again in the house. Women just bring us special blessings. And so, ladies, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you for what you bring to the table. It is recognized and it is appreciated. But these women, again, because they have been blessed by Jesus. They believe in Jesus. They follow Jesus, and therefore they supported the ministry of Jesus. Okay, let's deal with uh, important thing number two: seeds and soil. Look again, if you will, at verse four. At verse four, it says, "While a large crowd." was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town. He told this parable. He told this story. A farmer went out to sow his seeds. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because it had no moisture other seed fell along the thorns, which grew up, and with it choked the plants. Still other seed fell on the good soil. It came up and yielded the crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he had said this, he called out, whoever has an ear, let them hear. Stop right there. Whoever has an ear. Let them hear. He's not just talking about physical ears. He's talking about spiritual ears. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit would say. 
Now, that's important. That's important. In fact, anytime you go through the Bible, anytime you read in the Bible, anytime you read in the Scripture, anytime you hear a pastor, you know, say, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. Man, that's important. Take note. Don't just brush past that. Take note. What that means is, again, what is being said is very, very important. Now, we know that <clears throat> everything that Jesus said is important. But there are some things that are more important than other things. And so what Jesus is saying right here is, guys, what I am saying to you is very, very important. Listen up. And what he's saying is this, guys, listen up. Remember, we've talked about this before, how that it is God's will that people everywhere will be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so what this passage of Scripture is telling us is this, is that Jesus went everywhere. He went everywhere. He just didn't hang out over here with this town or with this group of people, but he went everywhere. And what did he do when he went to all the different places? He's preaching the good news. Notice that, the good news, not the bad news, but the good news. And what is the good news? The good news is God so loved the world, not this section, not that portion, but God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's good news. Good news. So everywhere Jesus went, everywhere Jesus went, again, he talked he taught about God the Father, his goodness, his kindness, his grace, his mercy, his holiness. His holiness. He taught those things. And then he taught about the kingdom, which is to come, which we sung about. No more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. All of these things done away with. He spoke about all of those things. And then, then he gave an invitation. All who will. Let him come. Remember, after this, after he dealt with this woman, which the religious leaders said no to. After he dealt with this woman, who the society says is no good. After Jesus loved on her, forgave her many sins. Then he went everywhere else preaching the gospel. See, I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, I get great hope. I get great hope. See, because when I look in the Bible, man, and I see people in dark places, I can go, wow. God brought them out of the dark place. He'll bring me out too. Because he's not a respected person. So he went everywhere. Come on, guys. Come on in, guys. Come on in. Come on in. And so what this says is that he went everywhere preaching the gospel, inviting the people in, but yet some people still refuse to come. Some people, regardless to the wonderful, wonderful works that he was doing, some people still refuse to believe. And so what he's doing here in this passage of scripture is this. He is describing four different types of soils that represent four different types of hearts. He's speaking about four different types of soils which represents four different types of hearts. And here's the thing. All of us who are sitting here today, all of us who are listening online are in one of those four places. Don't think that this is just for the person sitting next to you. Don't think that this is just for the person across the street or your neighbor or your brother or your cousin or the guy on the street. Every single one of us, all of our hearts are in one of these four places. 
He describes four types of soil which represent four types of hearts. And they are, number one, a hard heart. Number two, a shallow heart. Number three, a divided heart. And number four, a good heart. And see, it's good for us to know these things. It's good for us to understand these things, especially when it comes down to spiritual things. If you're listening, say amen. Understand something. Understand something. The soil of our hearts must be receptive to the word of God in order for us to experience spiritual growth, maturity, and change. Let me say that again. The soil of our hearts must be, they must be receptive to the seed, which is the word of God, in order for us to experience spiritual growth, maturity, and change. Just because, again, a person comes to church doesn't mean that their heart is open to the word of God. I've seen it. No, you've seen it. You might have even been in it where people come to church and sometimes they're just as cold. Sometimes they're just as callous. Sometimes they sit there with their arms folded and their eyes are rolling. That's a cold heart. And see, and that's why it's so important to prepare yourself before you come to service. Do not think that you can just walk in the door when the word is going forth and that you're going to receive the seed of the word in its fullness and get everything out of it that is available to you. Don't believe that because it's not true. You have to prepare your heart. In fact, I tell you guys as believers, I tell you as our church members that, hey, Sunday morning, the preparation for Sunday morning begins on Saturday night. Saturday night, especially, especially if you have small children. So if you have small children, some of you know like on Sunday morning, you're trying to get them jokers dressed, it's like herding cats. Right? You try to get this one dressed. I don't want to wear that. I want to wear this. I can't find my shoe. I can't find my sock. And it's chaos. So what we learned as a family was, hey, Let's pull out the outfits on Saturday nights. In fact, they can put, pick their own outfit because when they pick their outfit, they pick that out and they know what they're going to wear. So the fight is over with. So you start on Saturday night getting the stuff ready. Then on Sunday mornings, when you wake up, man, begin to prepare your heart. Begin to prepare, again, uh, the church and the, the, the uh, atmosphere to receive. How do you do that? You begin to pray. In my household, every Sunday morning, there's worship music on. We're preparing the soil. We're preparing the soil. And something I learned a long time ago was if something jumped off in my house, it's probably jumping off of somebody else's house too. You know, if me and my wife have a crossword or me and the children have a crossword or whatever, it's like, okay, enemy is attacking. So I need to pray about this. I need to rebuke that. And if it's happening in my household, I know it's happening in other people's households too. So worship music is going on. God, soften my heart. Soften our hearts. Lord, prepare the people in the church Soften their hearts. Yes. And then come in early on Sunday morning. Don't come <clears throat> running in with your hair on fire. Come in early. Begin to pray. Thank you, Lord, that I'm here. Because first of all, Lord, I don't have a right even be in your house. Thank you, Lord, that you don't treat me as my sins deserve. Thank you, Lord, that you look past all of my faults and you see my needs. And Lord, I need you this morning. 
I need you this morning, Lord. I need you to do something fresh in me. I need you to do something new in me. And Lord, my, my son, my daughter, Lord, the different people in the church, I know there's going to be some people in there today, Lord, who do not know you, oh God. And you pray. That's preparing the soil for the seed. But if again, we come in rushing at the last second, we jumping up out of the bed at the last second and running out the door, you know, and, you know, and blowing the horn at people and get out of the way. Exactly. I'm going to church. Years ago, years ago, I sister the church, Cabbage Chapel for a lot of them. One of the guys pulling up in the parking lot. The parking crew was telling him, hey, no, you can't park here. You know, you park over there trying to direct it. He said, Sess, he's going to park where he wanted to park at. Park where he wanted to park at. And they got out of the car and started running. And they run him behind him because you can't park there. They find the guy on the front row. <laughs> yeah, you're going to receive a rebuke from the Lord. So again, we have to prepare. And so the question is, how important is it to you to receive? And not only you receiving, but your brothers and sisters. And so again, we have to prepare. So the first soil, again, the first soil is hard. It's hard. And life has a way of making you hard. Amen? Life has a way of beating up on you, making you hard, making you cold, making you callous. Life has a way of making you cynical. Cynical. That you don't believe nothing good. Somebody tells you, oh man, do you know that God loves you? And you go, this don't look like love to me. And you just so that's a heart right there that needs to go before the Lord. So if you come in today, right, or you're watching and your heart is hard toward the Lord, you're cold for the, towards the Lord, you're callous toward the Lord, take your heart before the Lord and ask the Lord to just give you a sign for good. A sign for good. Here's a sign for good. Some of you know this illustration easily. If you ever lived up north, you know this situation. You know that, man, in the wintertime, everything is bare. The trees are bare. The ground is hard. It's froze. It's cold. And you just can't wait. Right? But then after a little while, you look up and you look at the trees and you see these little buds on the trees. That means that something good is coming. You just ask the Lord, Lord, just, just give me a, a bud. Lord, just, just give me a, a sign. And if you are sincere in that, he will give you a sign. Because remember, he loves you in spite of you. He loves you in spite of us. He loves us. And that's a real good thing. Amen. So again, your hearts can be. Hard and cold. So the first soil again was just hard and nothing got through. The second soil was shallow. The word came in and entered in and they received it with joy. But it was only temporal. And why was it temporal? Because it was emotional. It was an emotional thing. Yeah. I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Yes, it's an emotional thing. They're on an emotional high. And that's, yes, God is good. But, but, as soon as the first test comes up, or as soon as any type of persecution comes up, you're out of there. Why? Hey, I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for the blessing plan. That's what I came in for. I came for the fish and the loaves. Multiply. Get it. 
all this testing, persecution stuff. I'm out. It doesn't last because it's an emotional thing. Third soil is a divided soil. Again, the word is received. This time, though, there was also a clear intellectual understanding of the word. To say yes to the word of God. To say yes to the teachings of Jesus Christ. They say yes. They know God's will is good and is pleasing and is perfect. And they're pressing. They're pressing toward the mark, toward the high calling of God, which is in Christ Jesus. But, but, it's a divide. So this type of person is a type of person that they can be consumed and get caught up in the things, the pleasures, and the riches of life. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is the type of person who works, you know, uh, 12, 14 hours a day. Six, seven days a week. Got to get it. Got to get it. Got to get it. Yes, yes. Need more. Need more. Need more. Got to get it. Got to get it. And when they do finally break away and go to church, they're thinking more about what they're going to do when they leave church than they are what's being said in church, let alone or what's, or trying to get involved. And what happens is eventually the word is choked out. And it dies. Then there is the fourth soil, which is good soil. Again, the word is not only heard, it's received, and it's practiced. What it means by practice is that the word of God becomes the, um, the it becomes the, the light of their life. It becomes the, uh, the main factor in their life. Everything that comes into the life comes through the word of God. Every thought, every decision, every action, every reaction is defined by the word of God. And when persecution comes, because it's going to come, to always understand something. Anytime you say yes to God, the devil is going to attack. I've told you many times before, when God begins to bless the devil begins to mess. Sometimes we, the people of God, we think that, you know, our, our, our walk with the Lord or it's, it's just going to be a, a continual, you know, uh, straightforward, easy walk, easy life. If somebody is telling you that, they're lying to you. And unfortunately, there's a lot of teachers, there's a lot of preachers, there's a lot of television guys who tell people to lie. They're telling you what your itching ears want to hear. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world, and we are overcomers through him who loves us. Amen? So... When God begins to bless, the devil begins to mess. But the person where the seed falls on good soil, they say, and none of these things move me. None of these things move me. That's why when we were singing the song again about God's goodness, and we were singing about heaven and the glory and all the rest of that, man, my heart and my mind always go to the fact that, man, look at all of that that's waiting on me. And I don't deserve any of that. I don't deserve any of that. And so when tough times come, that vision carries me through. Lord, you want me to walk through the fire? I walk through the fire. Lord, I don't like fire. You know I don't like fire. But if this is what you call for me to do during this time, during this season, thy will be done, O oh God, because I know that I know that I know that I know that you love me. And I know that I know that I know that the man of God, the woman of God is made in the furnace. I'm in the fire. And I know, Father, you have your hand on the temperature and you also have your hand on the thermostat. And when you're ready, I'm coming out. 
So as Job says, all appointed days of my life shall I wait till my change comes. I will not be moved. That's the good soil. And then not only will they not be moved, then on top of all of that, when somebody comes and say, yo, if you are going to get this, if you are going to get that, if you are going to be this, then you need to be in this place at this time. The good soil says, I will seek thee first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and I will let him add all of these things unto me that's the good soil look at what it says there in verse 15 in verse 15 it says but the seed on good soil stands for those who with a noble and good heart hear the word, retain it, and by persevering. Let me ask you a question. When you think of persevering, what do you think of? Do you think of somebody in the pool on the floaty with a lemonade? Is that persevering? No, you know what I think of last time when I think of persevering? I think of being up north in a blizzard. And my car got snowed in. And I got to walk 12 blocks to get to my house. And it snows like this and you, and you want to quit. You want to give up. But you persevere. Why? Because you know right over there, over that hill behind that snow plow right there, is my house. And it's warm in there. There's food in there. And on top of all that, my honey bunny up in there too. <laughs> and you persevere. So it says here again, again, that the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word of God, retain the word of God, and by persevering produces a crop. Write this scripture now. I want you to see the crop. Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, in the latter part of verse 22, it says, produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. See, God wants us to be fruitful. He wants us to be fruitful, but not only for ourselves, but for other people. God wants us to drink from the fountain of life. He wants us to, to tap into the spirit so that we can be fruitful, so that we can start bearing the fruit of the spirit. But then the fruit that we bear is not for us, it's for other people. You don't see a fruit tree eating its own fruit. The fruit is for other people. God wants you to be fruitful. He wants me to be fruitful. He wants us to be fruitful so that other people can eat from our fruit. When other people are walking around thinking there is no hope, there is no way, but your life can say, oh, there's hope. Oh, there is a way, and the way is Jesus. Well, how do you know? Because look at me. Look at me. What he has done for me, he is willing to do for all. He wants us to be fruitful. And so question, question, are you fruitful? Are you fruitful? What's your Christian life looking like? Is it fruitful? The question on the floor is, what is the condition of your life? As I said earlier, every single one of us is in one of those four spots. Every single one of us is in one of those four spots. And so question, what is the condition of your heart? That's something that I want you to go home with. That's something that I want you to think about all week long. 
What is the condition of my heart? Is it hard? Shallow? Is it divided? Or is it good? And the way you can tell this by the fruit. See, we all can say, oh man, my heart is good. Yeah? But compare those other ones. Be honest. See, because here's the thing when we're honest, then we can get help. I've been a pastor for a long time and then, you know, do, you know, counseling with all kind of people. And one of the questions that we ask couples when they come in, if they're going through a hard time, the first question we ask them is, if this can be fixed, do you want to fix it? And if one party or both parties say no, and there's nothing to talk about. Because you've already said you don't want to fix it. So you come in here, is this a formality, maybe to say that, oh, we went to marital counseling and it didn't work. You went in there with a hard heart. You didn't go in there to receive anything, to even think about considering anything. So again, don't just play games with yourself. Ask yourself. Ask the Lord to show you, Lord, what is the true condition of my heart? Okay, quickly. Important, number th important thing number three. The secrets of the kingdom. It's important that we understand this. So again, that we can understand what's going on with us and what's going on with other people. It's important for us to understand this because sometimes we will take the responsibility, well, our responsibility of our hearts and of our lives, and we try to brush that off on somebody else. As a young pastor, as a young pastor, I thought it was my job as the pastor, as the shepherd, to shepherd everybody in the church. So if anybody in the church had a problem, if anybody in the church had an issue, if their kids had an issue, then I felt that it was, it was my job to work them and walk them through those issues. And if they weren't going through those issues or they weren't coming out victoriously, then it was my fault. See, Pastor, you was just a better teacher. Pastor, you was only a better preacher. Pastor, if you were only a better counselor. Pastor, if you were only a better planner. Pastor, if you were only a better administrator, then none of those things would be there. Man, I was beating myself up and was ready to quit because I love the Lord. And I take what I do very, very seriously. And the Lord says, that's not your fault. It's the condition of the heart. It's the condition of the heart. You have no control over the conditions of the people's heart. You sow in the seed, you sow in the seed, you sow in the seed in the pulpit, you sow in the seed in counseling, you sow in the seed by having breakfast with this person, having lunch with this person, and doing all of these things. But the seed can only go through. When the soil is right, such a fault. And so once again, when it comes to your spiritual walk, when it comes to your spiritual life, don't try to put that on nobody. It's my pastor's fault. It's the elder's fault. It's my wife's fault. It's my husband's fault. No. That's all you, baby. That's all you. You got to own that. That's truth. 100%. Can I get an amen? So it's important that we know these things. And see, here's the thing. We're about done. When the Lord opens the door to kingdom truth, and kingdom practices, if we do not enter in, if we do not 
exercise those things, if we do not walk out upon those things, those things begin to fade away from us. God opens the door. He said, behold, I stand at the door. Right? Again, the Lord opens the door. But again, we have to walk through the door. When we do not walk through the door, the door slowly but surely begins to close. This came to my mind. You know, my wife and I was talking about this the other day. I have a younger brother. And this is why a while back, back before me and my wife even got married. See how long that was. But I'm saved and I'm going to church and I have my younger brother come and he's living with me and, you know, I'm getting ready to go to church that Sunday morning and he, he walks into my room and he says, yo, he said, man, something's been telling me all night long to go to church with you. I'm like, man, man, that's the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is weighing on you like that, telling you to come, man, he got something great in store for you. Come, come. Say, yeah, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. So he goes in there, starts getting dressed, and he comes back out and says, oh, no, man, I got a cold, and I don't want to be coughing on the people, and I'm not going to come. He didn't go. And I've talked to him, I don't know how many times over the years about the Lord. He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that, that, that fire, that passion, when you know that you know that you know that you know that it's the Lord calling you, and it's calling you to a change, when that comes along, if you do not make that change, if you do not walk through those doors, you begin to lose that. Before I became a Christian, you know, I'm walking up the street, I'm living my life, and I just felt it within my heart and my mind and my soul and my spirit. It's time for a change. Started going to church as a young boy. We stopped going to church as my teenage years. The last time I went to church, I think I might have been 18 years old, 19 years old. You know how it is. Easter's coming. It's time to go to church. So I go out and, you know, I'm getting ready to, to buy this suit because, you know, I'm going to church. I got to be fly, you know. I can't come in there half-stepping. I'm going to go buy this suit and all the rest of this. I got it all planned. And the devil says, now, you're going to spend all this money for this suit. You go to church on Easter. You going back the next day? You going back next week? Oh. So why are you going to spend all that money on that suit? And I didn't go to church for almost 10 years, 10 years. But then I just felt within my heart, it's time for a change. The Lord was calling me in. And when he called me in, guess what he did? He made me a pastor. If he can make me a pastor, truly, he's in the miracle working business. I love it when I sit down and I talk to some guys and they come in and they, they're ashamed of their stuff. And they're going, Pastor, I got this going on. They're so ashamed. And I look at it sometimes. I just laugh. That's it. Man, let me bring my junk out. And they go, Phew, and they open up. God wants our lives to be fruitful. So that other people can eat from the fruit. So again, where's your heart? How's your heart? And so again, and we're done with this. Check out what it says there in, number, in verse 10. It says, though seeing, they will not see. Though hearing, will not understand. It's spiritual wisdom, knowledge, fire, passion. If we do not walk out on what God calls us to walk out on to, we begin to lose it. And so, as Jesus said, and we're done. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. Amen? Amen. Let me give you some lessons to go home with, some key takeaways from today's study, and we're done. Hmm. Number one, believing in Jesus does not make you a disciple of Jesus. 
And believing in Jesus does not make you a disciple of Jesus. Number two, being a disciple of Jesus means that you follow and support the work of Jesus. Being a disciple of Jesus means that you also follow and support the work of Jesus. Number three, in order for us to experience spiritual growth, maturity, and change, our hearts must be receptive to the word of God. Again, continuously take your heart before the Lord, asking him to show you the true condition of your heart. And number four, when God opens the door into spiritual truth and we do not enter in, that door begins to close, slowly close. We don't move out. The door slowly but surely closes. And this week's challenge is to take your heart before the Lord, asking him to soften it so that you can receive from him and be more fruitful. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit would say. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you, uh, that you love us. You love us so much, oh God.